Okay, well, my show, uh, which originally was called the All Request Beatles Show, a very lame title to start with, <laughs> um, was in March of 1982 on my college radio station, WNYT, which was for the New York Institute of Technology in Old Westbury, Long Island. A friend of mine asked me to do one. I never had it in the back of my mind to do a Beatles show, but I started doing it on Sunday nights. We got a great response to it. Um, I had a co-host for a year. And the show on college radio on that station lasted for a year and a half. I was recommended by um, a great guy in the business, Dave Morell, to send a tape to WDHA in New Jersey and uh, to send it to Mark Chernoff, who was the program director at the time, and um, to see if I can get my Beatles show on there. Originally, he asked me if I wanted to do a Motown show. He didn't ask me if I wanted to do a Beatles show, but I convinced him that I really loved doing the Beatles show. And uh, when I first started doing it on college radio, all I did was mix Beatles and solo music together. And I threw on a ton of trivia and games that I mixed into the show. They're all games that I came up with when I was in high school that I applied to pop music, but I just mixed it in with a Beatles show and gave it Beatle titles from songs and albums. And I gave away prizes every single week. I got a local re uh, record store on Long Island to give me really cheap prizes. Didn't really matter what they were, 45s, whatever. People called up. And, and you know, fans want to win anything. So after a year and a half, WDHA took the show. It was really there that the show fully developed. I started to incorporate news and very thorough news. It would sometimes run five to ten minutes which as you probably know on terrestrial radio, they don't want you to talk for that long. But yeah. uh, I wanted to do that to prove the point that the Beatles were not pure nostalgia and there was always stuff going on. And um, so I had news in the show. I mixed the group and the solo music. I developed thematic sets, which ran any, anywhere from really wacky ones to very simple ideas, acoustic sets to... Um, songs with Paul on drums, songs uh, that share the same title, there are different songs, um, tributes to 50s rock and roll artists that the Beatles loved, songs that have Elton John in them, songs that have Eric Clapton in them, Bob Dylan, Jeff Lynne, Nicky Hopkins, things like that. And in addition to playing all that music, the biggest influence in the show for me was a book that came out that was a discography called All Together Now, which was a series of books by Harry Castleman and Walter Pedrazic. The first book took you through 1975. It was a discography that not only included the Beatles and their solo music, but also their BBC recordings, songs they wrote for or produced or played on for other people, Apple recording artists, um, the original artists behind Beatles songs. I mixed all that together because to me, that was the Beatles catalog. I didn't look at the Beatles as being just 1962 to 1970. So all these elements that I mixed in, the trivia, the thematic sets, the news, I had live interviews occasionally, made it a very unique show. And the show ran there for 10 years, um, later on B103 and Aldi Station on Long Island. And then XM Radio uh, took my show, which I then called Every Little Thing. I finally you know, put a little effort into the title of the show and every little thing really was the perfect title for that. And it was on their fine tuning channel. This is before the merger with Sirius. And I also did short features on their 60s channel, um, Beatle News Breaks and just Beatle Breaks. When the merger happened with Sirius, I, I lost both those gigs, but then I started to syndicate the show. And it's now on 55 radio stations a combination of terrestrial radio and a lot of internet radio stations that I've all done by myself. It's now condensed down to a one hour show with thematic sets, mixing everything that I told you musically in there. Um, there's bonus trivia if stations want to run that. And so, um, you know, the station, I'm still building on more and more radio stations. And then in addition to that, I got into the podcast world and I, co-host two different Beatle podcast shows, Things We Said Today, which has been on the air since 2012. 
that's anything that has to do with the Beatles group or solo. And then there's one called Talk More Talk, which is strictly on the solo careers of the Beatles. And then uh, the last year or so, I developed my own YouTube channel, Just Conversations on the Beatles, and it's called Ken Michaels Radio. So that's kind of in a nutshell, everything I've been doing in the last 40 years, but it's been a labor of love for me you know, every aspect of the show, trying to put together something that's really creative, something that's really different. And, uh, and, and my aim in doing every little thing is not, it's to mix songs that, you know, the casual fan knows, that basically knows the hits with deeper cuts and to throw things in there that even the most knowledgeable Beatle fan may not know. If a listener tunes into every little thing and they hear one thing they never heard before or learn something they never heard before then I feel like I've done my job so um that's what every little thing is all about most of the work I've done in the last 40 plus years has been wrapped around that show but I have done quite a lot now since 2000 really 2009 there was another podcast show called fab forum which I left and then formed things we said today in 1992, I bought this uh, Mitsubishi that had a CD player, and there were, that was the first car I ever owned that had a CD player. And at the same time, a bunch of Beatles CDs had come out and some bootleg stuff too, uh, like Ultra Tracks and things like that. And I had a long drive, so I brought those CDs in the car, and I was just listening to the stereo separation and some of the outtakes and some of the other stuff, and I just was blown away by how great it was and sad that there was nobody. In, I, I'm in the Miami market that was doing a Beatles show in Miami or in South Florida, Fort Lauderdale. So I went to my program director. I was working at Magic 102.7, the oldie station. I was the creative director. I did all this mixing, all the promos, and I was on the air on Saturday night. I had a high-energy Saturday night request show, uh, which I loved, Jukebox Saturday night. But I wanted to do a Beatles show, and I went to my program director, who was a big Beatles fan, and said, I have this idea. You know, nobody's doing anything on the radio that's about Beatles as far as like a, a full show that's narrated. And scripted and he says well put something together so it was coming up on the 25th anniversary of sergeant pepper so i made a demo of that just a long form version of the show I played it for him he liked it so we started on may 31st uh, 1992 which was as close as you can get on a sunday to uh the anniversary of sergeant pepper uh 25th so uh at the time the station i worked for had like four other stations they were mom and pop and but they had a like Indianapolis, Rochester, um, Laconia, New Hampshire, and, and one other. And so they put the show on all five stations at the same time. But, Ken, you probably remember, it was like I would make a reel-to-reel, -reel and then I would mail it media mail. You know, it was like it was $2.90 media mail. And yep. then I was so poor, I would ask the stations, please send the tapes back, you know. So um, that's how I did the first uh, year of shows. And then I started buying dats and doing them on dats and making copies and Dats at the time were like $17 a piece, you know, it was like crazy. And then eventually I um, bought one of those CD stacker recorders. And um, by then I had, uh, by one, like you did, by one station at a time, I had built it up to 39 stations, just mm -hmm. me and my CD stacker and doing it after hours. I didn't have a studio at home, going into the station on a Friday night and producing the show for the following week or whatever. And uh, finally, in, in the year 2000, I... Um, got offered a syndication th deal with uh, Westwood One, and they were great, and they took it to like 120 markets, which was really fantastic uh, in 19, it was just about 2000. Uh, so for eight years, I basically syndicated it myself, which is you know, like running a marathon every week, and then you'd get a call on a Friday. I didn't get my show. You'd have to FedEx one for Saturday delivery, and that was like 50 bucks, you know? So I wasn't making any money. I had Mark Lapidos of the Faster Beatles fans of Beatle Fest at the time was a sponsor, and I had another uh, guy called The Music Machine, and they sold rare records. So just there, like 100 bucks a week or whatever, was keeping the show afloat. So um, that was great, and Westwood One was fantastic. They also had a show, The Beatle Years, at the time. Right. You might know that show. And I think one of my fears was they were bringing me in so they could – close it down and you know they would either own it or have control over it and then they could just you know make their show bigger so i was a little bit nervous about that but they turned out to be pretty great and i had a great relationship with them and then about two years ago two or three years ago they decided they weren't going to do music shows anymore i guess they were making more money with um, talk shows and sports and that kind of thing so they discontinued beetle years and my show and now i'm with compass media who um 
is pretty good. So they distribute. I just upload the show to an FTP site. Um, and, you know, it's great because instead of having to ship it two weeks in advance, I can upload it on Wednesday, and then it gets distributed to all the stations through um, their Mr. Master, it's called. It's like a, a thing that goes right into the station's uh, audio vault. So um, I started doing that. Uh, my favorite memory was uh, I got to interview Paul McCartney, I, but they he was rehearsing his tour at the Miami Arena where the Miami Heat play, and Ooh. it was like 10 miles from me, and the, the manager called me up. He says, well, I've got you an interview with Paul McCartney. I said, great. He's like 10 minutes or, you know, and a half hour from here. They go, no, it's in Tampa. So that was huh. a five-hour drive. So it was like you can either do the interview and by drive to Tampa or – I said, well, can't I just drive down to the Miami Arena? It'll be there in a half hour. So they, I, I did go to Tampa, and it was fantastic, and he was so unbelievable. And um, I remember I, I had to wear two shirts because I was so nervous. I was, like, all sweating underneath. But he was great, and uh, he came into the room, and it was just me, his publicist, and there's a videographer. And uh, I had one of those mini – I probably still have it – this mini-disc player. It was like a silver mini-disc player. We've all used them to get listener comments and stuff like that. And that's all I brought, and I had tested it over and over again. On and on, put new batteries, record. I had a microphone hooked to it. And um, I went to, and so Paul walks in the room, and he was really sweet. He goes, oh, so you do a Beatles show, huh, Joe? Beatle brunch, you know, whatever. And uh, I said, great. I said, let's record. And the stupid red button wouldn't go in to record the interview. And I, and I was like, what am I going to do? Am I going to ask the camera guy? Can I have his audio, or am I just going to pretend it's working? Or what am I going to do? So I just added desperation. I just hit it with my fist, and it went into record. Huh. So I learned a big lesson, man. I'm never going to travel with it. Well, we all have iPhones now, but uh, I'm certainly not going to do that again. But uh, it was great. He was so – his publicist said to me, don't talk about Heather. He was still with Heather. Don't talk about Linda. Don't talk about his kids. Don't talk about the Beatles. Only talk about the new album, which was Chaos and Creation at the Backyard, or the tour. But it doesn't matter. With Paul, you can say, hey, Paul, I saw you last night in Miami, and you played for two and a half hours. He goes, well, in the Beatles days, you know, we'd play for 29 minutes. If we loved you, we'd play. If we didn't, we'd play for 26 minutes, you know. So, huh. so it, it was really great to get him to talk about the Beatles. And then I had written this a sheet of liners, but I wrote them so that I could use them evergreen. So I had him say, uh, hi, this is Paul McCartney, and listening to Beatle Brunch with Joe Johnson. Pause. And now we're going to play a track from uh, blah, 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 you know. So um, that was definitely the highlight, uh, and, uh, and I've had a couple of interviews with Ringo as well. And my, one of my favorites, since I'm a production guy, was um, interviewing George and Giles Martin when the Love Cirque du Soleil show came out and going up to Las Vegas to see that as, at the press opening. And they were just so amazing. And who knew that you know, Giles was eventually going to take over the whole dynasty of all the Beatles music and all these amazing remixes and... Uh, uh, I, I know everybody has a, a thought about that, but I was interviewing Jeff Emmerich a couple of years ago at, the, at Abbey Road on the River, uh, which is Memorial Day weekend, and we talked about that, and he goes, I never listened to any of that mashup. So for me, the pure mono is the only thing I want to hear, you know? And I said, so you, don't, you never listen to, like, the love mixes? No. You never do this? No. He was really, really adamant about it. So, uh, and, you know, I guess because he was the, the architect part-time mostly for putting all those records together from uh, revolver all the way through to the breakup i guess pretty much until let it be but uh anyway so the show is still on but the best thing about it is um a couple of years maybe 10 years ago i i started uh, the beetle brunch club and it's a website where listeners can join and they can go in and hear every show on demand going back to 1992 and it's i've been putting i call them old brown shows you know they have these really old shows and from when I first started, and I can't stand to hear my voice in 1992. I'm going, I sound like a narrating a newscaster. So, um, but we have the Beetle Brunch Club, which is great. So every week I upload the show, no commercials, and I usually put bonus tracks of stuff I didn't have time to play. And uh, it's been pretty successful. We have like 700 members because, you know, I have far few oldies stations, Ken, as you know, you know, that and, and Andre, that oldies – you know, now when I started at Magic in 1987, we were playing songs from 57. So we were playing Buddy Holly and all that. So now if you go back 30 years from now, it's 1992. And that, that would be the equivalent of an oldie today, I would think, right? I mean, I don't, I don't know, Andre, did you guys play like real 60s oldies or mostly classic rock? On MGK? Yeah. 
Uh, no, exclusively classic rock. In fact, we, we've even lessened the amount of Beatles that we play. Yeah, right. Some of the older stuff starts to fall off. The Jefferson Airplanes, yeah. some of the Creams, you know, so the, some of the older Stone stuff and the Who hangs in there. But by right. and large, the needle's shifting. You know, more yeah, Pearl yeah. Band, Stone Temple Pilots, Soundgarden, and less yeah. of the Stone stuff, just going with the demographics. And I think that's kind of what happened to the audience. And I know uh, Sean's going to get into it with Beatles music because – the the you contact the program director oh nobody wants to hear the Beatles anymore meanwhile they they you know like eight million people watch the Get Back trailer or whatever you know what I'm saying so uh, in one day or whatever so they certainly have staying power and they certainly keep reinventing their mode you know their format with the 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 latest that came out that I know we're going to talk about later Sean but you know so I'm I'm very fortunate that I have Beetle Brunch but I I know that eventually you know few and fewer stations it's going to be like playing you know string of pearls you know at some point you know from <laughs> 1925 or something so um i'm always i'm prepared and uh, and i'm built i built this website and uh, we don't really make any money on it it's just a matter of getting people to stay with the show and yeah and, i'll start with uh, telling you how i got into the show I, I, since i was uh three and a half years old i've been into the beatles my parents told me that i watched uh, ed sullivan but i never got to i don't remember it uh my mom sat me in front of the tv but later that summer, I became hooked when my older brothers would bring home records like uh, the Beatles' second album, and I'd listen to Please, Mr. Postman, and I would lose my mind dancing around my house in Alney back in the day. And from that moment, I was hooked on the Beatles. So everything in my life musically was the Beatles. Yeah, I like the Monkees. Yeah, I like the Stones. Everything was about the Beatles. My brother my father really fed my passion for it by always buying me all their albums when they came out. And in 1966... They didn't communicate. And my brother and my father on the day release both bought me Revolver. Uh, my brother Alan brought me the stereo and my dad bought me the mono. So I'm like, well, I'll just listen to both of them. Then I started noticing things were different in the songs. I started hearing a little extra vocal in Yellow Submarine. I heard Taxman's Cowbell coming a little early on the mono. So that just opened up a whole new world for me. And I just completely geeked out on just the audio facet the recordings and the songs and the sounds of the Beatles. And, and never did I, my wildest dreams that I think I could have a show about it. I always dreamed about doing it, but I was always too shy to ask program directors when I started. I, I started when I was 16 in radio, WPST in Trenton. And I'm sure if I had asked, I might have gotten a shot, but there was no way I was going to. It wasn't until 1989 when uh, my dear friend, John Roberts, who passed away in 2020, a longtime program director, uh, brought me back to Philadelphia from Dallas to work at WYSP in my first foray into classic rock radio, which was exciting for me because although I'd done Top 40 and AC and even New Wave back in 83, which I loved, classic rock was really my favorite because of the Beatles obviously being the cornerstone of that format. So I got to the radio station uh, in December 1988 and around about March, John says to me, well, you're Beatles maniac. Why don't you have a Beatles show of your own? Do a Beatles show. I'm like, get out of here. What do you want? What do I do? He goes, do whatever the hell you want. I'm like, that's perfect. So from that moment on, I started a business model of the Gonzo Beatles show, where I would be the first person to get every release. I would play bootlegs like they were going out of style. As soon as I got my hands on one, I put it on the air. And I just wanted Beatles fans to hear this stuff first. And uh, that started a long uh, series of shows at WYSP in 1989. Took a little break when I went up to K-Rock in New York to become program director there. Uh, obviously, it wasn't on the air at the time. Uh, but then came back to Philly at MGK to continue the Beatles show in April of 2002. So I went right back to that gonzo way of doing my show where I would call them rarities. But I play eight to ten bootlegs every single show. And never once did I get a cease and desist from Capital Area MI because... I had people on the inside <laughs> helping me get this material. So I was the first person in the world to play the uh, Sgt. Pepper outtakes, the White Album uh, box set, Abbey Road box set. I also discovered the uh, mixing or the mastering error on the um, Capital Albums Volume 2 box set because I got the set like a month early for my show and realized that they'd screwed up two of the discs on the set. So in having those relationships with record companies and people here and over in London, I was able to get this stuff and play this stuff. Uh, and really, I mean, let's be honest, I was getting my rocks off for two hours. That's all I was doing. So if anybody else enjoyed the show, that would be great too. As you guys know, the Beatles are timeless. So we have a lot of fans, a lot of listeners on the show in the early days. 
But again, demographically, as the listening habit shifted, listeners got older, new listeners came in. From a rating standpoint, I could see the uh, the drop, but never once did my boss, uh, Bill Weston, say to me, you know, we should talk about dropping the show. It was my decision uh, first last year when uh, they decided they said no, but then this year when I said, you know what, I think I want to do other things, which I really wanted to do uh, other things in my life because, I mean, I've got all you guys know, this is a labor-intensive show to put together every week, and I obsessed over that Beatles show every single week. I'd spend hours and hours and hours on it, so I just wanted to free up some time for myself and my uh, family. So I stopped doing the show in January of this year and uh, left it to others to carry on the tradition. I'm waiting for some young kid to come in and do a show (laughs) and give me his or her bend on the Beatles from a young person's standpoint and take it into the future, but it hasn't happened yet. But I am happy that on my last show, I was destined to play something from deep in my collection that I'm never allowed to play. And I played a uh, live performance of the Beatles at EMI House in March, 1963, when they were accepting the Silver Record Award for Please Please Me, they did a private performance for EMI executives and someone surreptitiously taped it and I got a copy and played it on my last show, which to me was a great uh, thrill to do, owing to my gonzo way of doing the show. So I've had an incredible time doing it all these years. I leave it to these guys to carry on the tradition. Now I can sit back and listen to y'all's shows every week and not work on the show all the time. You know what blew away, Andre, was you talking about bootlegs when I got the Ultra Tracks and I put it in and it was, I saw her standing there with her. Dun, 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 oh, you couldn't started. believe the quality. I was like, and it was in stereo and I had this brand new car with like six, nine speakers in it. I was huh. freaking out. It sounded so great. So yours, yeah. yours was in stereo, but the first, my first pressing that was in mono because they screwed it up. The freaking, uh, who was it, Swinging Pig, whoever it was, the first one. Was right, in. right. That's right. That's so right. only got one channel. It sounded really weird, but yeah, it was great. I didn't get my show till uh, back till about a year after. I guess '88 those things came out. So by '89 we were getting all the swinging pigs and all the yellow, uh, dog, yellow, yellow dog. dogs and all that great stuff. And I was thrown on the air. I had guys, I had guys waiting at the airport in baggage claim, picking up these packages and running it over to me on Sunday morning so I could throw it on the air. I mean, we used to have the greatest time. I had this crew of like guys in the underground who hooked me up. That was part of the fun of the show. Because you guys are too. I'm a one-man operation. You know, I'm yeah, producer, totally, producer, totally. producers and, you know, I just get in the way because I'm so out of control with this. But it's just nice to have that network of people on the side to uh, take care of you, you know? I just wanted to say to Andre, it just sounds like with you and me, I don't know about Joe, <coughs> talked about you had carte blanche. You could do whatever you wanted to on your show. That is so rare in terrestrial. Yeah. I every, mean, playlists are so terrible. To start off on a blank piece of paper and fill it in every week. Well, who gets the privilege of doing that but us? I mean, it's insane. The fact that we're entrusted to do it, because, I mean, a lot of you guys work for yourselves, but the fact that I have a program director who knows I'm not going to go too nuts. You know, Chris, he might know I go a little off the mark with uh, underground stuff, but they just let you do your thing, and they let you show your passion and let you show your love and knowledge. I mean, you guys can run circles around me when it comes to knowledge. I'm just like the uber fan who just tries to eat it all up and try to listen for the fact that the remasters left out the little click on the Paul's soul at the end of Strawberry Fields there that will drive me nuts till the day I die. That kind of stuff that I, I love, the minutia. I think to answer your question, Ken, is uh, I, I would have to answer to the if I, the format of radio stations that they would call or sometimes call and say, you know, you should be playing yesterday every week because, you know, program directors, they want those P1 listeners, whatever. So, uh, you know, and I didn't do that. And I did like like you guys, I did play the uh, unofficial stuff, but I just kind of I didn't I just said, here's a studio take of su- such and such. But uh, I didn't want to tip my hand too much, but I tried to stick to the familiar stuff, especially in the beginning. But now it's it, th- things are so necessary that I'm like playing stuff from the McCartney three and always looking for new things to put out as Ooh. well. So, you know, I remember the first time I played a new song, I was kind of afraid that the oldie stations were going to freak out. But, you know, the Beatle fans liked it. So I, I think we were OK. I remember on WDHA, I would play bootlegs, too, but you'd never say it was a bootleg. You just played it. <laughs> you you know, um, here's Yvonne from the Press to Play sessions, you know, and not say that it wasn't released. He just played it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, but I think we're all very conscious of the fact that you've got to play songs that people know and you got to mix that with deeper stuff. And for, for me personally, that's part of the thrill is playing the deeper cuts, playing solo music that people don't know, mixing it all together and making it somewhat different than what you would normally hear on the radio. And these days also, at least I'm very concerned about the DMCA laws 
I have to be with all the radio stations that take my show. There's always a few stations that are very concerned about that, and it limits what you can play, what you can put into your show, which for anyone watching that doesn't know about this, um, this was a law that was enacted, I think it was 1999, and I think it was done to protect the artists from people recording them on the air, but you're not supposed to play more than four songs from the same artist within a three-hour block. I think that's for broadcasting, right? So it's, in other words, you the station could block out the show, I guess, or something. But I mean, they could, I think, is it just for broad, broadcast? That it's law? strictly well, for digital. It's if for it's streaming. streaming. Yeah. So when I do my syndicated show, I don't play any more than four Beatles songs in that hour. But you can play four solo John, four solo Paul. Right. You have yeah, to question whether that. or not is, is Wings the same thing as Paul McCartney solo and... Oh. Right. That's true. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the good thing about, I mean, Paul, when he puts out these re-releases re of like Tug of War and stuff, he'll put out, you know, the solo version of Ivy and Ivory, just him or a rehearsal on piano. So you always have those to go to, which is great. You know, 20 mm -hmm. years ago, we didn't have much of that unless it was unofficial. Yeah, despite that, none of us got uh, cease and desists uh, from Apple. I got, I got contacted by their lawyer one time because I got multi-tracks for Sgt. Pepper. And I stupidly plugged it on the air rather than play it. I'm like, coming up, world premiere, Sergeant Pepper. What an idiot. Right? Yeah. So, of course, they're going to they're gonna email me and say, what the hell do you have? Send me what you have. You know, I was like, wow. look. And then I then I plead, um, what's what's the act? The, uh, the, the MCA? Fair use, fair use clause of U.S. copyright laws. Yeah. Fair use. I'm educating my listeners about this Sergeant Pepper. Multi this is an educational show. So I'm only playing little snippets to educate them about how these songs were made. And then I, I, never I think if you guys know Scott Fryman, I think that's his workaround is he's using it. He, he can play like up to a minute and 19 seconds or something. He has to run everything by the attorneys. Have you ever watched, you watched those DBs, Andre? The, yes, yes. Deconstructing the Beatles. <clears throat> and he, he lists it as like an educational thing. Educate, yeah, it is. Well, it, it is. really is. Yeah, yeah I'm curious. What's the number one listener? request as far as Beatles songs and how has the app changed over the years? You know, I was going to say when I would, when I would go to Beatle Fest and I would always ask people, oh, they go, oh, I listen to your show. I go, what do you like about it? Instead of them saying, I like the way you crossfaded this version of Ebony and Ivory into the thing and you had George Martin. They go, oh, the music. You know, so they they were just about the, the average listeners about the music. So I'm going to say the if, if you took a poll, it's always going to be yesterday, unless you're a freak like us, you know. It's always going to be yesterday or Hey Jude. And I remember asking listeners at the fest, you know, what songs? Do you, oh, I love the Ed Sullivan show. Well, what songs do you remember? Well, Hey Jude, and so you know what <laughs> I mean. So they, you just have to kind of, you know, the listeners, you know, thank you, but uh, you know, the the four of us, um, or uh, you know, I kind of feel like we're the ones that they're they really depend on. Yeah, and, and you have a good question there, Sean, too, about how it's changed over the years. I think uh, as we've seen. In real life, in the world too, I, we're see, I'm seeing much more appreciation for George's material over the years. Right. It's so nice to hear both the adults revisiting and young people who really have have been spoken to by George's music and his lyrics uh, see it get the respect that it deserves. Totally. From what agree. I remember, I mean, now every little thing is strictly a syndicated show, and. I'm not playing requests. I don't encourage requests on that. But when the show was live, and most recently I was continuing it on WNHU, which is the college station in Connecticut, I would say probably the song that I got the most requests for would be Hey Bulldog. <laughs> huh. Wow. Why? But uh, just on that station alone. But I also have noticed that it was brought up quite a lot that when um, the Beatles music was available for streaming, that Here Comes the Sun is the most streamed yeah. Beatles song, yeah. which yeah. is great. I mean, it wasn't a single. It's a very popular album cut, but it's really risen, you know, in stature over the years, as has George's songs in the Beatles and his solo music, as far as I'm concerned, from what I've observed. Yeah, one of solo the things that I... I I started, I'm sorry, one of the things I started doing was on my Facebook, Beetle Brunch Facebook page, is I'll put a question and they'll answer with a song like, what do you think is the best love song for Mother's Day or whatever. So then I ask them to record a voice memo on their phone and they text it or email it to me. And then it's, it sounds great. So, I mean, that's Ooh. that's kind of how I do requests. And I do a bu maybe four shows that way each year. I'll, I'll give a, like a month's notice on Facebook and I'll, or even on the show that I'm voicing. 
and say, uh, hey, we're doing a Mother's Day request, so then people will leave a voice memo of that. And I started that way before uh, the Beatles channel, because I've been doing that for a couple of years. They, they're they doing that now with some of their channels, you know, the people mm. leave a mem memo, so. Absolutely not. Some kids do. Uh, some kids go through a Beatles phase, they don't realize it because they like a band who's clearly influenced by them. But I think I think the days of all, every young person having their Beatles phase on mass are are over, just demographically, personally. You're always going to get the fans. They're always going to have fans of all ages, no question about it. And God knows, Capital EMI goes to Great Lanes Universal to promote them to younger younger people yeah. as a lot. Uh, but I just think it's like it's like any like Elvis. You know, Elvis had his time certainly, uh, but I I really do believe. Uh, that there will be a small but loyal group of Beatles fans forever. I think my my dream of everybody loving the Beatles forever is probably that, just that. What do you guys think? I think that, uh, I, sorry, Ken, I think that um, especially if you have the parents and the grandparents that are really into Beatles and they travel with the kids, that's where the Yellow Submarine t-shirt that goes to the floor and they start singing the songs. That That's about your best, that's about as lucky as you can get if the parents embrace it. But if the parents are in their 30s and they're, they're not listening to the oldies, then then chances are they don't have a connection to it. And and like you mentioned, Ed Sullivan, it's, we, we saw something that brings us back and we have a connection. They may not, you know, and unfortunately, Ken. I don't think the numbers for younger people can ever be as great as they were in the 60s and even the decades that followed. And the 70s was a very special time because you had the solo careers doing so well, and that helped the Beatles catalog do well at the same time. But um, you do have a number of ways for young people to discover the Beatles, like you said, Joe, from parents and grandparents. But you've also got the Beatles channel on Sirius XM. There are more podcasts than ever before on the Beatles. It's multiplying in numbers that I can't even keep track of. But then again, I think most people who are into people talking about the Beatles are far more hardcore fans, not new fans that are just discovering them. But you never know. Um, Beatle fans could be curious. I think what is really remarkable is that, um, and I mentioned this to you, Sean, when we did our interview together, who else can you name in this day and age when an archival box set makes the top 10 in the Billboard charts? You know, Sgt. Pepper, yeah. White Album, Abbey Road, Let It Be, all went top 10. That's remarkable for music that's more than 50 years old. And to say that for the Beatles, and I really can't think of, at least in the U.S., any other groups or artists that you can say that about, you know, that's got to tell you that for older music, the Beatles music stands out. I don't think it's, like I said, as big in numbers as in the past, but I still think that it's very significant. And there'll always be new fans out there. It all comes down to whether they're exposed to the music. You can't say that every young fan, if they hear Beatles music, is going to love it but I guarantee you some of them will. And that's why, you know, a catalog will die off if you don't get new fans and young fans. But we've always still had, whether it's through all these different outlets and streaming services, especially. I mean, young fans are discovering the Beatles through Spotify, YouTube. You know, there's other ways to discover the music without physically buying it. And that's a big help too. So, um, you know, I still think that the numbers are significant. I literally played um, Good Night and wonderful music uh, in headphones uh, while my wife was pr uh, pregnant, literally in the womb. I'm playing Beatles music, hoping that something would come through. Uh, my daughter likes Cream and Fleetwood Mac. So what are you going to do? But of course, it's all the new stuff today. Uh -huh. but I tried. I really tried. And I, think I, those, I think the 70s bands are making a re, a re... You talk about Fleetwood Mac, there's now... On these cruises I host, there's like a, a cover band for every, there's a Hotel California cover band. There's a Fleetwood Mac cover band. There's the, and there's, and there's a Queen Nation, which is the most incredible cover band I've ever seen of Queen, Freddie Mercury. And, and they're so good, but it, it, it's kind of weird. It's kind of like cheating because you really wish, but we obviously don't have a lot of the real artists around anymore. The Ask You Purists in the corner there, um, when they went back and put out the remix remasters uh, that included Day Tripper, they went back and they fixed. There was some, there were some flubs in the in this in the mixing of the song. 
I mean, the, Brian Wilson did it with Wendy. There, if you listen to that song, Wendy, there's a cough, really loud cough in the instrumental break, and they, they went back and remixed it. But they did that with Day Tripper. Um, there was a part where I guess George Martin had to pop the channel down really quick because there was like a tape glitch or something. And if you listen to the bootleg version, you'll hear it. But the, with digital editing, they fix these. Are you guys in favor of not just remastering but correcting things that were maybe oversights? Andre? Uh, no, I think it's a terrible thing. I think uh, if the Beatles are not there to make the decision as a group, I think we're doing a disservice to the way it was originally recorded. I missed that gap of tambourine and day trip rock because I had the first pressing right. of yesterday and today where it's on. It's like things like that drive me nuts. Like I mentioned the strawberry fields click. I mentioned the uh, John Lennon changing his tone pedal and I want you she's so heavy. I grew up listening to those little gaps and you know, the, the, we're not trying to be steely Dan here. I think we're trying to keep the warts and all on there. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just afraid that that's too much heavy handedness on the part of uh, people where the people who made the music uh, are not there to make the decision. I know George Martin gave his final blessing to Giles to, to do that. But even on the remixes, I feel like, you know, we're brick walling them. We're appealing to younger audiences. We're trying to make them breathe. So there's this, this less tightness in the mix. And it just lets a little air out of the tires for me, as far as I'm concerned, and, and, and taking some liberties that I wouldn't have, have done. And that, but that's me. That's me. You know, I'm, I'm not the genius who's selling I mean, all the records. On the past masters, they went as far as putting the right verse where, you know, that was, that was wrong the first time for John Lennon. They made it, they like re moved, they moved the verse around within the song to make it correct. And that, that's a little, I don't think most people, most casual fans would just, but you know, but having said that, I'm glad they repaired She Loves You because there were some of the worst edits on She Loves You I've ever heard, like on past messages. I mean, you can see there was, there was probably like leader tape this thick running past the tape. Somebody finally oh. fixed that and made it sound palatable now after all these years. What, there's six edits in that song, and you could hear them all on past messages. Paul McCartney. Paul McCartney. <laughs> I'm the nicest too. The nicest is Joe Latesto. He's the nicest guy and he makes you feel like so nice. he knows you're terrified in his presence and he goes out of his way. I had fans, I know this is lightning, but it's a great story. Uh, the, the second time I was supposed to interview Paul was supposed to be on the phone, but as you all know, Jeff Baker, a wild man in, in, of his own right, um, ended up pulling me inside to interview him. And this is moments after some fans had shown up and given me a joint. I don't know why they did it. I just kind of put it in my pocket and then Jeff brings me in and then I sit down in the t chair and Paul comes out from his sound check with Jeff. And then Jeff goes, you guys want something? Paul goes, yeah, give me some water. Jeff leaves. So I think for two seconds, do I pull this joint out in front of Paul McCartney? Do I, do I try to pull it out? And of course, cooler heads prevail. But I thought I could have had a hell of a story or I could have been arrested on the spot. But Paul huh. McCartney, what do you say? Right. Best non-Beatle interview. Oh, oh wow. can I just say Ringo for me? Because I had the chance yeah. to interview him three times. All very brief interviews. Actually, one it's was very fast. Yes, of several people when his Why Not album was released. But um, it's always a thrill. And I talked to him about his songwriting, which very few people do. I talked to him about. He's known for his drumming, but ever since his Vertical Man album, he's co-written almost every song on his albums. And yes, there were songs in the 70s he co-wrote with Vinnie Poncia and with George Harrison. But I, I was a thrill for me to talk about that aspect with Ringo. And I'd give anything to interview Paul. <laughs> Never had the chance. No, Ringo's, Ringo's great. And uh, Ringo, the last time I interviewed him was my 1,000th show. He called in, which was very nice. Yeah. And uh, he busted my chops. He's like, oh, you still have a job, huh? So you know when you go bust <laughs> yeah. your chops, you know you're in the club, which is great. I was excited about that. Favorite non beetle boy, where, 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 where do you say Linda? I say Linda McCartney. I had lunch with Linda McCartney at a truck stop in Carnforth, England in 1990, and she was sweet. She was telling great stories. She talked about a song that Paul wrote for the family that despite all things together, uh, they stuck together. It was called Staying Power, and I never got to ask Paul about it, but she started talking about it, and she started welling up talking about it. It was, right. it was a beautiful moment, and she was as genuine as they, as they came, and I was an honor to to spend time with her at a truck stop in Carnforth. Figure that one out. I, I think for me, it might have been, if, if, it's, if we're going that level, uh, that connection, I would say George Martin, because when I went to see The Love Show and I did an interview with him and Giles, um, I saw him at an after party, and he came up to me and he goes, how did you like the show? And I said, oh, I thought it was wonderful. And he goes, oh, good, I was worried. I don't think he was really worried about me, but he, he was so sweet to say that. 
So I would say I was in because I'm a production guy. I was in awe of George Martin. I just couldn't believe this guy mixed yesterday and 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 all of that. So fantastic. Oh, there have been yeah. some great. And yeah, Norman Smith and Ken Scott and Alan Parsons and all those guys. You know, trying to find Phil McDonald, but apparently, last I heard, he was like a masseuse in New York, and you can't find him. I don't know what he's doing nowadays. You know, for me, it's really tough to narrow it down. I would say Mark Lewis and is such an incredible interview. Any interview you hear with Mark Lewis and you will learn something about the Beatles. And I got to interview him when the Beatles Live first came out, his book, where he researched everything the Beatles did live, even from the Quarrymen days. And before um, Tune In came out, I got to interview him and he told me a lot of revelations that were in the book. So, but there's so many people. Carl Perkins is probably the nicest person that I've ever interviewed yeah, in my life. Yeah. And um, I'll just tell you this one quick story, which is one of my favorites, but he was doing an oldie show on Long Island at the Westbury Music Fair. And Roy Orbison was on the bill and he closed the show, Roy did. And I had already interviewed Carl once or twice before that. And I tried to find out if he would give me another interview. And I was fairly certain he wouldn't remember me at all. And he said to me, yeah, the fellow from New Jersey, the New Jersey rock station, right? And he took me to his van while the concert was on. And I got to miss Roy Orbison, except his last song. And um, he reached into the glove compartment and he took out a folder and it said the Carl Perkins fan club and all four Beatles signatures were on it. Wow. Oh. Wow. He I carried that with when, him, I guess, wherever he went. I so he shared that, had, uh, which was him. so nice of him. Wow. He made everyone the, treat, that he met he treated them like gold if all you knew was blue suede shoes from his catalog he'd treat you like you were royalty so he was beyond nice yeah i agree he um when go cat go came out and and i had the album i asked him we were doing a phoner and i just said i would love for you to sign this and he gave me his home address and i sent it to him and he signed actually there's a picture if you look in the middle it's the, uh, above the thing you can see of the carl yeah. perkins oh yeah he was yeah, he was just fantastic. You're right. I, I, I should have went to him first. He was so warm. Yeah, Andre, I'm going to flip over all the cards. Um, what did you end up doing for the last song on the last show? The last song on the last show? you think I would remember, wouldn't you? Isn't that funny? You I, know, I, it could have you know, been the end. It could have been Long and Winding Road. I think it was, it was the something end. else. That's the thing. It's like I didn't. I didn't really. I, I didn't. The way I ended my show was, I just ended it like any other show, and then I just announced at the end that it was over. Like I didn't want to make a big deal about it. I just wanted to say goodbye and thank everybody for it. So it really, was no special show, except that I snuck in a few of my favorites. That was about it. But that was it. I had a great time, though. I had a great time, and I learned from all these guys every single week. And it's just nice to be in the same uh, same virtual room with them all. It was a joy. And you too, Sean. I love your work too. I love all your Sean Ross on radio. 